Let's start with um, this project in Holland. Now, I just want to say before Helen reads this that Newton once told me seven poems and seven images saved the green heart of Holland. <laughs> and this is really how they present. So I would like, um, Helen, go ahead and, and read it. Read that. The, read green, the green heart vision begins with a quote from the first president of KLM Airlines in the early 1930s. Flying over the thousand square kilometer center of Holland, of the lowland, mostly farming villages and windmills and meadows, he said, how beautiful. This is our green heart. Our whole history is confined within this place. Let us preserve it forever. It is so beautiful. Hmm. So we're going to talk about the green heart project in Holland? Well, it, had, it, was, it looked like it was going to stop being beautiful. Uh, we were commissioned by, we were called by the Cultural Council of South Holland. Could we save the green heart of Holland? They were going to put 600,000 houses there. And they were going to put a $220 billion economic engine. And everybody had a notion they are going to get rich except everybody had a notion they didn't want to give up 35 villages and their whole history. And so the question came to us, could we save the green heart? And then they sent us 10 books. Each one was going to save the green heart and failed. And once understanding that, it was very easy. Um, we signed so the a 10 books were 10 projects that they had commissioned. Yeah, they had commissioned. They were running about 500,000 each uh, to make these thick books. Um, and so uh, uh, once we read them, scanned them, only a fool would read them, um, uh, we, uh, we, we forthwith signed a contract that we would save the green heart. So they, they introduced us to Congress people, and they said, what makes you think you can do this? We said, well, you know, you can't. You failed already. And anyway, we're cheaper. Once I said we're cheaper, they said, OK, and proceed, we proceed. <laughs> Um, the Dutch are frugal uh, and very good to work with. Thanks. Let's go. So the Green Heart looks like that. There are 35 villages. Next. First thing we did was make a map reversing the country, did it backwards, put in a couple hundred thousand houses. They said, why'd you make our, our country backward? They're very indignant. We said, you're designing it backward. They said, OK. Is, uh, they got over annoyance. They said, what's forward? So we said, look, if you build a biodiversity ring around the green heart, you'll end up with, a 400, with 800 acres, 800 square kilometers. And, and see those, um, those wiggles? That's what they call them. Those were long parks between each city. If you kept those parks, then the cities couldn't blend into one another. Some lunatic there was proposing they make a Los Angeles of themselves and blend their whole history together and wreck themselves. <laughs> Each city, Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Den Haag, Utrecht, uh, um, uh, uh, Dordrecht, uh, Leerdam, they all have their uh, individual identities. They all have persona. They all are individual cultures. And so we, we, we made a, a concept. Let um, ecosystems be continuous. Let culture cultural entities be framed, and see the whole thing as a yin-yang, and don't plan one part without planning another, and particularly dump 600,000 houses out of there. Well, the Dutch, being practical again, said, where are you going to put this 600,000 houses? And um, we had a real smart student, graduate student. We said, go ahead out, and uh, here's an unlimited budget. Come back in two weeks and show us where to put 600,000 houses. So nobody told her that this was a, like a five-year work by a serious <laughs> body of people. And so um, she, she, said, she called up and said, it's going to take an extra couple of days. We said, OK. <laughs> and um, she comes back with this drawing. She finds that you can easily put more than 600,000 houses in the perimeter and that the new people who come will have parks to build against. New people who come are generally 
the poorer people. So, um, uh, so then, all of a sudden, we're uh, lionized. Why? Well, we got, 200, we got $220 billion spinning into the country instead of going out to Eli Brown or somebody. Uh, that's a well-known developer. And um, California. Um, All right. Yeah, so that's <laughs> enough. Uh, this is a good art collection. Very so good. anyway, um, so we get approved. It gets approved. And? New, new, new people come in. New government comes in. We get disapproved. <laughs> they put us on the shelf. I hate when that happens. Five years pass. Oh, they tell us to go home, so we went. Um, five years pass. We get a telephone call from the Ministry of Environment. The bad guys are out. We'll use your plan. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. This is true. Now, what's interesting is you, you and Helen won the Grunewald Award that year. <laughs> And yeah. it was actually for the most important work anybody did in the country of Holland. I yeah. think that's what it was. Yeah. yeah <laughs> okay. Yeah. But, but I'm going to share this, this story that you shared with me about, about walking in the woods with Richard Feynman, the physicist. So, so he's walking through the, you're walking through the woods with Richard Feynman, and he begins to talk to you about the way he, he creates equations, and there's something missing in every... Cre every equation he, he comes up with, right? Yeah, right, it was about a 10 minute walk or 15 through the eucalyptus grove. I understood really that two geniuses were walking in the woods, him and him. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, so, so what, what happened was that we, um, I looked and I thought and I talked with Helen and Helen and I did a review of all our work. Well, because so wait, Holland's, let's go back one minute. Because Holland seemed insufficient. Let's go back one minute, because what he said was in every equation he did, he realized something was missing. That's true. That's true, right? And, and he realized the something was nothing. Well, and nothing, nothing was... is something. So he had, to, he had to equate for it. Yes. And this made you think about your work. Yes, and we, we reviewed 30 years of work with Holland. That's right. And, and we, we began to think that maybe we had to think a little differently. And we Something was missing, missing from every single work. work. Holland was our best work. It was insufficient. And we thought, maybe we have to go to physics. And that That's general. right. Yeah. Helen, you said that you told me that you told Newton, I think we need a new In language. Fact, yes. Physics. And I so we looked and we concluded <laughs> there was a force going to work. And this a giant, giant force was we'd switch the weather. A heat wave was coming across and touching everything and changing everything. And on top of that, waters were rising and a great ocean was happening. A uh, force was working against all lands. So we had two new frontiers. And these frontiers were terrifying because they moved toward us. On top of that, um, you can't really exploit them. All other frontiers were exploited. So we began to look for what we could come to. You identified and you called this, this something yes, the, the force, force majeure. majeure. OK, so let me show you some force majeure works. Um, uh, actually, one other thing. We, we concluded that, as Helen was going to say, that all of our processes of extraction, we're very skilled. We extract forests. All of them weaken ecosystems, OK? If nature, when it extracts or takes something, gives back. We're real good at taking and real bad at giving back. And actually, somebody said, what's the matter with government? We said, you need a new government. And that government would be a dictatorship of the ecology. So, um, <laughs> oh, don't like that, huh? Don't like all the term right, dictator. All right, now come on. Anyway, let's, let's go with this. Um, <laughs> we're going we're gonna, to, I'm, I'm going to move this along because what happened was you began to think bigger. Yes. You began to, to include this force majeure in every project that yes. you did from then on. And yes. your call really is that you want to normalize the way that we think about the force majeure, that every single one of us has to understand the impact of this force majeure. Let's get to Europe. You scale up. OK. So the EU and the German government and a bunch of museums pass a lot of money uh, to begin thinking about Europe. 
Normally, we, we work by agreeing to go someplace and think, okay? So we do a map of Europe, and we, uh, oh my goodness, you went fast, it's a little too fast. Europe, it's, okay. You see the clock? That's why I'm going fast. Oh, I see, okay. <laughs> okay, the peninsula of Europe's gonna have a drought. They got uh, 2.4 million square kilometers of farm, about a third of that's going under. They got 450 million people, gonna be 500 million people. The water's gonna rise, the land's gonna shrink. Unless you do something at great scale, you're gonna have civil unrest, you're gonna have all kinds of pain and problem. Very wealthy people always do well, but there are not so many of them. So the great majority of them is at risk. And so what we propose is to start thinking in million square kilometer increments. What you need is a water retention landscapes like this, that's in Portugal, done over a whole subcontinent. It's doable. It only costs a trillion dollars. We drop a trillion dollars on a war in five years. We want them to drop a trillion on, on restoring that landscape in that way. Where's the power come from? It, it, you democratize the rain. And there you go. All right, so let's talk about closer to home. Okay, so um, some, we never do things on spec except somebody said, what would you do for the bays at San Francisco? And we'd been thinking about San Francisco and uh, uh, the bays, and we imagined a uh, three meter water rise. Three meter water rise, have we got there? Look, there's the bays, next, next, look at that gets on up to a three meter water rise, gives you a 400,000 acre estuarial lagoon. Estuarial lagoons are highly productive. You get about 400 million pounds of food wet weight off of there. We would outcompete irrigated farming without wrecking any rivers. We would outcompete <laughs> irrigated farming without blowing our water supply. We, a new ecosystem would form and you could honor it by the way you harvested with a harvest preserve system. And so that's what we've got to change into. Getting still closer to home, uh, you can look up at the Sierras. The Sierras are in trouble, everybody knows it. The temperature's rising 10 degrees. Uh, the snowpack's going fast. Uh, glaciers disappearing fast. Flood and droughts happening to rivers and more so. Um, and so what are you gonna do? Is there something doable? So for complex reasons, which we'll skip, but they're neat, um, <laughs> Talk to him later, or? Um, we, can't, we, we get invited to do a work at the Sage Hen Watersheds, the Berkeley uh, Research Station, 9,000 acres, high Sierras, 20 miles south, south of uh, Lake Tahoe. What we do is we interrogate the watershed. We say, Mr. Watershed, you know, um, Mrs. Watershed, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Maybe a couple, matter of Mr. and Mrs. Watershed. Uh, <laughs> or both. <laughs> so, so um, what lived through all those millions of years when you did have flood and drought? We found 20, 20 species. We grew 12,000 plants. We just planted them. The Native American Washoe joined us, and we're going to find Native American wisdom. Uh, we're both wearing uh, thank you notes from, the, from them. Uh, um, they're going to teach us stuff we didn't know. Uh, we're going to help educate their kids. It's, it's wonderful. We're going to give them the, the uh, American way or the, the, as well, so that the, the children have both okay. the scientific and the uh, work from their own uh, culture. Ethnobotany. Together, because we're collaborating. That's right. The whole <laughs> issue here. Totally. You know, like, I mean, we talk about collaborating with each other and personal stuff. The whole issue is collaborating with nature. Let's go to Tibet. Yeah. So I just want to say, like, very quickly, what they're doing is they're interrogating the watershed. They are planting plants so that they can collaborate with Mother Nature as she retreats to the high ground. If we plant plants that can survive, as Newton said, perhaps it won't take 10,000 years. They're scaffolding as well, we're the We're looking at hundreds of years, retreats. not thousands. So, so this is the third. This is like the first year. What's still there? Yeah, that's meeting with in the their in yeah. their um, proving ground. So, yeah. I mean, we're doing work in Tibet now. We've posed the question of. Uh, can China invent an eco-security system, not unlike a social security system? We're just beginning to raise the funds, and we've got a team. 
answering that. We're also doing a, a designing a forest that will follow an ecosystem, follow a glacier uphill as it melts. Um, and that would make a very, very big difference in many, many countries across the world. However, we're out of time, so Helen's going to do a 30-second reading. OK. And you can see the images here of, of what they're Oh, we have our own map makers. We told them to make a map of Tibet that was bruised, and then make it look bruised, a little bruised, and that was up with Tibetan plateau took up most of, most of the world and everything else shrunk. And that's what that is. You have to create and play and compose like nature does and improvise like nature does. So As the bottom line is that they're still at it. You know, at a time they could be sitting in their rocking chairs and thinking, not my kuleana anymore. I mean, not my problem. These eco-warriors are still at it. They need help. They have a center for the force majeure at UC Santa Cruz. Okay, they are doing any. work on a scale that maybe nobody else is really working on. Consider helping. Helen, and hoping you that there are others. Read that. The intention of all of this work is nothing less than to lower the entropy or disorder in virtually all planetary ecosystems. It is the only whole systems course, of course, of action that will mediate the mass extinction of species, the stress around all systems brought about by global warming, which is the force majeure. It is a survival-driven imperative not the only one, but one of the very, very few that are going on. Thanks. Thank you. Okay.